Ushnir Grover is really, really not happy right now. And this doesn't have anything to do with Bharat Bay or the lawsuits that have been filed against him. Instead, this is about his own startup third unicorn and his fantasy sports game, Crick Bay. So he tweeted this out on Tuesday. It was good fun being part of the fantasy gaming industry, which stands murdered now, $10 billion down the drain in this monsoon. So what is he talking about here? Well, during the 50th meeting of India's GST council, it was recommended that casino, horse racing, and online gaming be taxed at the uniform rate of 28% on full face value. So with that 28% GST, we can come back to Ushnir Grover's tweet here and see what that looks like from a unit economic standpoint. He says 100 rupees to play on 72 rupees pot entry, and that's after the 28% gross GST. And then if they win 54 rupees after platform fees, then they have to pay 30% TDS on top of that, which would mean the winnings are 37.8 rupees. I mean, look, this is really simple to understand. The government is increasing their tax take. Why are they doing that? Well, it's great for the government to get more money, but also they want to slow the growth of this space. It's been up until this point, very easy to start a gambling app, a gambling game, get people addicted and make money from it, right? Just like alcohol, cigarettes, smoking, any kind of vice that is addictive is very easy to get people hooked into, easy to make money from, and especially people who are vulnerable, people who don't have a lot of money and hope that maybe these games, these apps could help them elevate themselves out of poverty, and then they get hooked and then they just can't escape and then it becomes this spiral, right? right? So the government doesn't want that. It doesn't benefit the country in any way. And so they are taxing it to slow its growth. The best argument that I can make on why the government shouldn't have done this the way that they did, increasing the taxes so dramatically all of a sudden, is that this is actually going to make India a far less attractive destination for investors who are outside of India looking in saying, should I really put my money into a country where the government, the regulations, the taxes can change on a dime just like that and wipe out my investment so easily? This kind of reminds Reminds me of the Chinese tech crackdown that happened in 2021, where overnight they cut the ed tech industry off at the knees and suddenly billions in FDI that investors had poured into China and specifically into that industry was just worthless. And so I want to show you guys a clip from CNN News 18 that I thought was really relevant to the situation. Those who are again saying it sends mixed signals to investors, because it will become a policy black mark. Government earlier recognized separate status and potential of this sector, many say. And you waited, you allowed this industry to grow for 10 years. Why didn't you put the rules then? Why didn't you set up a framework when we were setting shop? The sentiment was also voiced by Gabar Singh on Twitter as well, and he said that the issue is of policy inconsistency. First, they allow them to proliferate, create jobs and capital, and then one fine day, pull the plug. It took them 10 years to realize it's not a game of skill. Such policy risk will always spook foreign investors. And if we read between the lines here, the thing that he's not saying, but is probably implying here is that these are foreign investors generally. These aren't just investors who are interested in the fantasy sports segment, gambling, gaming, any stuff like that. It's actually foreign investors in general who are looking at India and they're also looking at a bunch of other countries and they're saying, do I really want to park my money in India where the government can just snap their fingers and wipe out my investment when I could be putting my money somewhere else? And I think a lot of investors, unfortunately, are going to make that latter decision of putting their money somewhere else after seeing what's happening here in this space. All right, next up, I don't know if you guys saw this, but Dukan and specifically one of its co-founders, Sumit Shah, is getting a lot of heat right now. So Sumit posted this thread on Twitter detailing why and how they laid off 90% of their support staff and replaced them with an AI chatbot. And many people were calling Sumit inhumane, saying that he has no empathy, that he's heartless, and that he shouldn't have said this on Twitter. So what exactly did the tweet thread say? Well, to sum it up, Dukan needed to prioritize profitability over growth, the way that a lot of Indian startups and startups around the world, frankly, need to do right now. It's just the season that we're in. This funding winter necessitates this kind of behavior. And so having a support staff staff was costing the company a lot of money. And so Sumit decided to fix this by building a chatbot called Bot9. He and his team built Bot9 for themselves, calling the internal version Lena, but then they've also made it available now to other founders who want to implement chatbots on their websites too. And the thing is that overnight, Lena was able to take care of roughly 200 live chats and roughly 1,400 support tickets. So it was obviously clear to the Dukan team that this was something that they needed to continue pursuing. And eventually it just made sense to lay off a 
about 90% of their support staff. Now, a few years ago, I actually got a chance to sit down with Sumit and have a conversation with him talking about the story of his company. You can check that out up here if you're interested. But I reached out to him because I saw how massive this was getting. It was really blowing up. He was getting tons of hate. And I just DM'd him on Twitter and asked him a couple of questions. So firstly, I just asked him what kind of response they've been getting on Bot9 and its website post the tweet thread. And according to Sumit, people are using it like crazy, creating 3,950 chatbots at the time of me talking to him on Twitter to handle support requests on their websites and other companies. I also asked him how many staff they laid off. He said 23 employees. And actually, this is back in September of 2022, which I didn't realize. I think most people thought that this was a recent event, but apparently this happened all the way back in 2022. I also asked him if he helped these employees out, if there was some kind of severance package or not. And he said the employees who were laid off were offered a two month salary as a severance package, which is standard. I believe that most of them have already found new jobs. Additionally, I've personally connected a few of them with my investors and fellow founders who would be interested in considering their profiles. And then finally, the last question that I asked him was how he feels when people say he's not empathetic or that he's heartless. His answer was really clear and direct and unapologetic. I don't know if this is going to add more fuel to the fire or not. Uh, I'll let you guys decide. Leave a comment down below and let me know what you think of this situation. I'm, I'm just presenting it to you guys. I'm not taking a side here. I just wanted to get the information in front of you all. So here's his reply to my question. He says he laid off his employees because it's efficient, cost effective and the future. He also said he'd rather be heartless than brainless. And also he's not sorry for his decision, but rather he's proud of it. And he'd rather be honest and unpopular than dishonest and adored. Oh, and also he said that for people who are doubting whether AI can provide quality responses, he added that this entire message was actually AI generated. And if you want to read the whole message, feel free to pause the video here. I'll just show it up on screen for a second so that you guys can get a chance to pause it. I won't go through the whole thing, but that's what he said. Now, my take here, uh, you know, on a more macro level is that this is going to keep on happening, right? I think we all intuitively know this is the pace of progress this is where things are going. AI is getting way more powerful every single year. And I think the risk is that a lot of people in these positions, these low level positions like support agents, for example, are going to be replaced and it's going to happen. It's going to be widespread. And so if you're someone watching this video, maybe you're a student or maybe you're at that stage in your career where you're a fresher and you're working in one of these companies as a support agent, my best advice to you is that you should upskill yourself. And this does sound like there's a sponsored segment coming up where I talk about Skillshare or something. That's not the case. I'm just recommending this is my prescription to you continuously upskill yourself. Keep watching YouTube videos. Maybe that's the plug. Keep watching Backstage with Millionaires to learn about what's going on in the ecosystem so you can keep getting smarter and you can keep uh, increasing your skill level so that you're more employable at a higher level where AI can't touch you. All right, next up, I have an update on Tesla. This is really interesting. We actually have a potential price point for Tesla's entry into the Indian market. It looks like they're trying to, at least at some point in the future, sell their EVs for 20 lakh rupees per car. And this is just a little bit more expensive than the top of the line Mahindra XUV 400 EV. And obviously 20 lakh rupees is not cheap. Most people in India are not gonna be able to afford that, but definitely people in the middle class, upper middle class segment of Indian society on EMI will definitely be able to afford this and they'll want to buy it too. Tesla, well, I'm guessing will have a lot of prestige associated with the brand. Brand. It's an American company. It's aspirational. And so I think they're really pricing it at an affordable price point, especially if you consider where Ola Electric is planning on coming in with their four wheeler at between 40 and 50 lakh rupees, according to Bavish Agarwal. Now, obviously, Bavish is taking a page out of the Tesla playbook here, starting with a premium offering like Tesla did with their Roadster and then moving towards a more mass market car. We can actually see that. That's their timeline. Probably a premium EV at 40 to 50 lakh rupees at the end of 2024, then a premium SUV. SUV. And then finally, in 2026, or maybe a little bit later, there will be a mass market EV coming from Ola Electric. And I can't imagine that Tesla is going to be able to get their factory set up in India and start selling before 2026 anyway. So it's very possible that in three to four years, we're actually going to see Ola Electric competing neck and neck with Tesla in India's EV car market. But this is also really interesting because Tesla's Model 3, that's their most affordable budget car in the United States, sells for 40 lakh rupees. So there's really two options here. Either one, Tesla actually creates a vehicle specifically for India, or maybe they're already working on something like this 
space for the global market. And so by 2026, it'll be ready and they can start selling it in India. Or alternatively, maybe they're just going to slash the price of their Model 3 by 50%. Who knows? Either way, though, Tesla's conversations with the government of India are evolving. And it looks like now they definitely want to set up a factory in India with an annual capacity of 5 lakh EVs. All right, next up, a company that we really haven't talked about that much. It used to be in the news all the time. Now, everybody seems to have just moved on. Cred. So they actually have to break even now in eight months. This is according to Kunal Shah's internal target that he set for the company. Now, according to the ARC, in order to achieve this, they'll need to bring in annual revenue of between 350 and 380 million dollars. So how are they going to be able to do that? Well, one of the ways that they're going to do it is just, of course, decrease their burn. And they've been doing this pretty successfully. In 2021, they were burning 15 to 20 million dollars a month. Then they had brought that number down to 5 million. But they're also pursuing five methods of increasing revenue as well. The first way is that they're planning to offer targeted financial services to their existing users who they now have a ton of data on regarding their credit history. The second way that they're planning to increase revenue is to actually make their app more valuable for people to come back and use. Let's be honest, cred coins kind of lost all of their value in the early days. They meant something. Now, a lot of people just have cred coins sitting around. They don't even know what to do with them. So cred is going to be working on that. The third way is actually digital payments via cred's UPI option. So cred is currently number four right now in this space. There's phone pay, Google Pay, Paytm, and then Cred. So in June, they actually saw 73.9 million transactions through Cred UPI worth 23,431 crore rupees. And they've also introduced something called Tap to Pay, which is a feature that allows Cred users to pay with their credit cards using their phone. So you don't actually have to have your credit card with you. You can just use your phone and you don't need to bring your wallet as long as your phone has NFC built in. The fourth way, of course, is through lending. This is pretty much what everybody in this space is doing right now and they actually acquired two companies one is parfait finance and then also we have credit vidya so regarding parfait cred owns 20 percent of that company and kunal shah owns the rest of it and of course it's an nbfc which enables them to offer loans to their customers and then credit vidya is actually a SaaS startup that helps firms to underwrite first-time borrowers my prediction is that lending is going to end up becoming the core business of cred and other companies in this space as well we're already seeing this happen with paytm and one of the reasons for this this is that lending is just becoming more and more popular in India as people build up their own financial history after the advent of Adhar and getting people connected to the internet. India is changing right now. It's becoming a more digital economy and a more digital country in general. And so it looks like between 2020 and 2030, the growth in India's digital lending space is going to go through the roof. So in just a decade, it will have gone from $270 billion to $1,284 billion. Another way of saying that is $1.284 $1.284 trillion. And then the fifth and final way that Cred is planning to increase their revenues is just hiring operators to increase their operational efficiency so that they can make more money and also save that money. All right, now I've got two quick news items to share with you guys. First of all, Front Row, an upskilling platform, is shutting down and they're going to be returning some of their money to investors. Specifically, they'll be returning $2.5 million out of the $17 million that they've raised from these investors. That's about 15% of the investment being returned. And then the second quick news item that I have for you guys this week is another update on Baiju's, which at this point, I think it's safe to say Baiju's is in the trough of Soro. This is a common startup word in Silicon Valley. The trough of Soro is when a company is really just like on death's door, right? And they could possibly get out of the situation, but they've never been this low before in terms of public perception and also financial challenges. And so they're bringing on advisors, mentors, to join their board. So we've got Rajneesh Kumar and also TV Mohandas Pai filling the vacuum that's been left behind by Vivian Wu and also GV Ravi Shankar and Russell Drydenstock. So TV Mohandas Pai was actually an early investor in Baiju's and I'm not sure if he's held onto a stake over the years or not. If he has, they're probably worth quite a bit more than when he invested that money. And he actually publicly praised the company all the way back in 2013. These were early days for Baiju's as an ed tech company. And then also Rajneesh Kumar, for those of you who don't know, is a former state Bank of India chairperson. All right, next up, let's go through some of the funding news this week. It's been a bit of a rough week, only $50 million raised across India's entire startup ecosystem. And here's what that 
that looks like in context, but the leader this week was SaaS management platforms Luri. They raised $20 million in their Series B round, and like many Indian SaaS companies, they're kind of a US Bengaluru hybrid company. They're in both countries at once. A little bit further down, we have an EV battery startup, Neuron Energy. They raised $2.44 million in their pre Series A round. Then there's Ocula Aerospace, raising $1 million in their pre seed round. They're offering long endurance UAVs, basically unmanned drones that act as sensors or data recorders for large scale enterprise use cases like keeping an eye on oil pipelines to make sure nobody's stealing oil or ocean ports to keep track of the boats that are coming and going, that sort of thing. And then finally, I like to talk about AI companies, BrainSight AI, which is making it easier to study the brain for clinical researchers. And of course, it employs the use of AI here. They've raised a little over $100,000 for their second seed round. All right, that's it from my side. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks for coming back week after week. This is news video 165. We've been doing this for 165 weeks, which is crazy. And you guys just keep coming back and watching these videos and leaving comments and give me your feedback, connecting with me on DMs on social, meeting me in the real world. This is happening way more frequently now and I, I love it. Um, so thank you guys so much for your support and for watching our videos. And I'll see you in the next one.